everybody. Welcome to episode 16 of The Bitter Pill, uh, the show where we talk about bitter pills of truth that many people don't want to swallow and that the corporate media uh, doesn't want you to know exist, but that are important for us to swallow, so to speak, uh, and understand the world we live in. Uh, because if we don't understand what's really going on, it's hard to make it a better place. Uh, one thing that I should mention is that uh, my phone's uh, broken right now, and I usually glance at it to uh, look at my notes for these uh, podcasts. Uh, so instead, I'm having to look over here at my other computer screen, which, uh, you know, um, it's not because I uh, am shy or anything that I don't uh, look you guys in the eye a lot of the time, but I've just got to look over here sometimes. Um, anyway, today I'm going to talk about a topic that's been in the news uh, quite a bit over the last couple of years, and that's allegations of various sorts of sexual misconduct against powerful men like Bill Cosby and uh, Harvey Weinstein and um, <clears throat> Brett Kavanaugh, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, etc., uh, and you know, why people do or don't believe them. Um, and I'll also be providing a lot of background information about rape and sexual misconduct in general uh, and its effects on victims and what people rightly or wrongly um, believe about it and just kind of the rape culture that unfortunately we live in. And the latter is going to be my uh, main focus today. Um, and then in uh, part two of this topic, I'll be specifically focusing on allegations against uh, presumptive presidential nominee Joe Biden, uh, which is a topic that's been in the news quite a bit uh, this spring, but now, uh, of course, is kind of taken a back seat to the murder of uh, George Floyd and the nationwide protests that have uh, erupted um, against that and against uh, many other things um, related to police violence, but really a lot of uh, other issues as well. Uh, and obviously that's an extremely important topic, and I plan on doing a video about that soon. But uh, I feel like this is important for us to talk about uh, rape allegations and uh, you know, why people often don't believe them, um, because you know, we have... Uh, the President of the United States, Donald Trump, and the presumptive Democratic nominee, Joe, Joe Biden, both being uh, accused uh, by multiple women of various sorts of sexual misconduct. Uh, and they're vying for the most powerful position in the world. So uh, this is something that uh, you know, we really need to talk about. Now, as it happens, uh, I have an academic background that's relevant to topics like this. If you've watched this um, show before, you know that I'm a uh, social psychologist. And a big part of what social psychologists study is social perceptions and attitudes and uh, judgments. So obviously very relevant uh, here. And a second hat I'm going to be wearing as I talk about this issue is that of a longtime activist on women's issues who thinks that uh, women who say they've been sexually assaulted or harassed or raped ought to be heard and taken seriously. And the evidence suggests that the overwhelming majority of the time, women who say they've been sexually assaulted are telling the truth, uh, and we ought to believe them. Um, and this is an issue that hits close to home uh, for me uh, because I know women who've been uh, raped uh, and you know, I heard their stories and I believe them. Um, and uh, these are people that are close to me and I've seen uh, the effects uh, that that as well as you know, the aftermath of it, people not believing them and uh, blaming them and uh, so forth. Um, yeah, I've seen the effects that this uh, has had on them. Sexual assault is a lot more common than a lot of people think. Uh, about 10% of victims are male, so uh, the overwhelming majority, 90% or so, are female. Uh, and it's a, a much more common crime than people realize, or you know, maybe you do realize it, but in any case, it's extremely common. According to one survey, nearly one in five women in the U.S. Uh, say they've been 
uh, raped or sexually assaulted or you know, that someone attempted to rape them. And one in six women report that they've been stalked. And that's also happened to these women I know that I mentioned. And it's also very traumatizing, and, and, and I've seen it happen to them. Um, <clears throat> as far as I can tell from conversations with female friends and uh, things I've read online, um, sexual harassment is essentially universal. Um, and you know, even though, obviously, it's you know, not as serious a thing as actually being raped. Uh, it is still very uh, psychologically damaging, a lot more so than a lot of people realize. And, uh, you know, often um, sexual harassment is a precursor to uh, in more serious uh, uh, crimes, to sexual assault. A significant majority of women who have experienced sexual violence uh, report uh, experiencing symptoms of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they meet all the criteria, but uh, for a diagnosis uh, officially of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, but uh, yeah, pretty often they do. And you know, one unfortunate thing about uh, sexual crimes is that uh, more often than not, there's not any physical evidence. Um, you know, women don't uh, go in and get a, a rape kit done. And if the assault uh, doesn't involve uh, ejaculation, then um, you know, th that's not going to help uh, anyway. Um, so, so it's you know, basically women's word and uh, the word of people they told at the time or uh, somewhat after uh, against uh, the accused persons. Um, and so out of uh, all these rapes that are reported to the police, and it's a tiny fraction of the ones that uh, actually occur, um, fewer than 1% result in a conviction. And that conviction rate is several times lower than it is for other uh, serious crimes. Women are still routinely accused of lying about being raped. Uh, even now it's been about two years since uh, Me Too became a household term in the aftermath of the widely publicized uh, multiple sexual assault allegations against uh, Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. Um, so you might wonder, well, how often does it actually happen that women lie about being uh, raped? Uh, so, so let's look at the data in more detail. In fact, re research suggests that the majority of people who are raped uh, don't even acknowledge it as rape at all, at least at first. Uh, when they do tell others, they typically only tell a few close friends or uh, relatives. Uh, it's certainly a rare occasion when uh, rape, a rape allegation makes national news. So only somewhere between 5 and 23% of rapes, depending on the study, are ever reported to the police. Um, and on average, only about 5% of rape reports made to the police, uh, give or take, depending on the study, are deemed to be false upon uh, investigation by the police. Uh, so... Basically, then, the point is that out of uh, the, uh, who knows how many uh, rapes that actually occur uh, in the United States each year, only a tiny fraction, about 125,000, are reported, um, you know, the vast majority of them uh, seem to be true. Uh, it's likely that considerably fewer than 1% of rape allegations uh, are false. Fortunately, uh, the nightmare scenario of uh, being falsely accused of sexual assault and uh, being convicted of the crime uh, is uh, quite rare. Um, a study in the uh, UK found that 
Out of 216 complaints that were classified by the police as false, only 39 even resulted in a suspect being named, and only six suspects were arrested. Only two led to charges being brought um, that were deemed false uh, before any conviction occurred. Uh, in the U.S., it's uh, a little bit more common for uh, false allegations to um, not only take place, but uh, result in, in uh, conviction and uh, prison time. Uh, the uh, National Registry of Exonerations found that over a period of 25 years, uh, they, there were 52 cases uh, that they found where men were uh, wrongly convicted of rape and ultimately exonerated. Uh, so that's about two a year um, out of you know, hundreds of thousands of rapes that occur in the United States, uh, perhaps over a million, I don't know. Um, one of the most famous of those cases was a case where five young black men were falsely accused of raping a woman jogging in Central Park um, about 30 years ago. And uh, in that case, police uh, coerced false confessions from the men. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so on one hand, uh, 52 cases uh, where men were wrongly convicted of rape and uh, ultimately exonerated over a period of uh, 25 years in the United States. Uh, to, for comparison, during that same period, there were 790 cases, according to that same study, where uh, people were wrongly convicted of murder and ultimately exonerated. Uh, so, you know, well over 10 times as uh, many such cases. Okay, so uh, false uh, allegations of rape do occur. Uh, sometimes, in fact, I've uh, uh, I've personally uh, been aware of a case uh, involving someone I know who made an allegation that uh, uh, did not uh, seem credible to me because uh, they told a story about what happened that uh, you know amounted to basically uh, being pressured uh, into performing a sexual act, but uh, you know, consenting to that sexual act. And then later uh, she changed her story to, I was raped, but uh, she didn't change any of the details of the story that suggested that, uh, you know, although it was certainly uh, not a good thing that uh, happened, uh, she felt pressured uh, you know, to do something she wasn't comfortable with. Uh, it wasn't non-consensual. Um, but uh, in any case, um, false allegations uh, occasionally do happen, um, and you know, one common scenario where uh, false uh, convictions occur in uh, criminal cases is when eyewitnesses, uh, you know, such as victims, uh, mistakenly identify a suspect. Uh, cognitive psychologist Elizabeth Loftus is uh, famous for her research pointing out how common it is for witnesses to a crime who are asked to identify suspects to identify the wrong uh, perpetrator. Um, you know, so, so memory isn't, uh, you know, uh, it's often not very reliable. Um, and uh, that's true for specific memory of the identity of a stranger that uh, someone has witnessed perpetrating a crime. So there have been some cases where men have been falsely accused of rape uh, due to uh, misidentification by eyewitnesses. Um, but there are a couple of reasons why it's quite rare uh, for men to be misidentified and convicted as perpetrators of rape. Uh, in fact, it's tens of thousands of times less common for a man to um, be falsely accused of rape than it is for a man to be raped himself. Um, and, you know, of course, men are much less likely to be raped than women. So that gives you an idea of how uncommon this is. But one reason why um, you know, this isn't very common is that uh, 
basically convictions are very hard to come by in rape cases in the first place. Um, a, a tiny fraction, um, five out of a thousand um, you know, allegations of uh, sexual assault uh, result in somebody being incarcerated for that crime. Only 230 out of a thousand are reported to the police, according to this one study. Um, so, in any case, um, the other reason why uh, it, it's extremely rare for someone to be uh, falsely accused of uh, rape is that the vast majority of perpetrators of rape are people that the victims know. Uh, anywhere from 80% to 95% of the time, uh, the victim knows uh, the person who assaulted them. Uh, so, obviously, if you know somebody <laughs> and they assault you, you know who assaulted you. Okay, well, what about those cases uh, where women do deliberately falsely accuse a man of raping or assaulting them. Uh, although rare, uh, they do happen. It's worth looking at the circumstances where such false allegations, uh, uh, rare though they may be, uh, tend to occur. One of the most common uh, scenarios the research suggests is uh, cases where an adolescent girl tells her parents that she was raped and avoid, in order to avoid getting in trouble, such as uh, having to fess up to being pregnant, or uh, even uh, in some cases for something as trivial as um, uh, truancy or uh, being out later than their parents' uh, curfew, uh, things of that nature. Uh, in fact, almost half of all rape claims ultimately deemed to be false by the police are lodged by someone other than the victim, usually parents. Uh, some of the claims that are ultimately deemed false are made by people who do so in order to uh, receive some sort of uh, uh, service, like uh, medical care or psychiatric medication. Another reason uh, why uh, excuse me, um, let me rephrase that. Uh, it's also common for uh, women who make false uh, allegations of rape to have a prior history of uh, bizarre uh, fabrications or uh, criminal fraud. Um, so one famous case of uh, a false allegation of rape was when uh, uh, members of the Duke Lacrosse, uh, Duke University Lacrosse team back in 2006 were uh, falsely accused of rape by a woman named uh, Crystal Mangum. And Crystal uh, Mangum had uh, a, pr a previous felony conviction, uh, also a previous rape allegation that was deemed by the police to be false. Um, and uh, a few years after uh, she made this allegation against the Duke uh, lacrosse team, uh, she was convicted of murdering her uh, boyfriend. Um, and, you know, she just had a history of uh, making these uh, often very bizarre uh, false allegations against people. False rape claims tend to occur for one of four reasons. Uh, personal gain, revenge, the need for an alibi, or mental illness, or some combination of them. So typically, uh, false accusers who are motivated by personal gain have a previous pattern of uh, false allegations, such as claiming to have been injured and trying to get compensation for that from a business or the government. Okay, um, <clears throat> false accusers found to be mentally ill typically have a long history of falsely accusing people of things, uh, often changing their stories without any particular regard for appearing to be consistent and uh, 
I believe that happened in uh, the Crystal Mangum versus uh, Duke Lacrosse team case. Um, <clears throat> however, the types of mental illnesses that are likely to lead to such allegations are uh, exceedingly rare. Uh, and again, compared to the number of real reports of rape, uh, or the even greater number of cases where w women are raped but never actually report it to uh, the police, um, and you know, in many cases don't tell anybody about it for years after it happens. Um, you know, in comparison to that, uh, the number of false rape reports is very, very low. Okay, uh, so given that false rape allegations are extremely uncommon, relatively speaking, um, why do people commonly believe that they're common? Uh, so there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is that when an allegation is made that does turn out to be false, uh, that gets a lot of publicity. So um, anybody that was following the news in 2006 heard about the uh, allegation against the Duke University uh, lacrosse team. Uh, and even when an allegation is credible, but the accused is someone a lot of people like or admire and don't want to believe that they could have done something like that, uh, those people tend to assume that it's a false claim, that the alleged victim is lying. So think about uh, when Christine Blasey Ford, Ford uh, came forward with an allegation of attempted rape against uh, Supreme Court nominee uh, Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, there were many, many people who didn't believe her, um, even though... Uh, in many ways, her story was very, very credible. So either way, where um, there is a false allegation or where there are a lot of accusations that uh, you know, an allegation is false because there are a lot of people who uh, like or look up to uh, the accused person, um, you know, we hear about uh, that allegation a lot. And when we hear a lot of um, you know, claims that an allegation of rape is false, uh, you know, just hearing about it a lot makes us believe that it's a common thing for false allegations to occur. Uh, so a psychologist like myself uh, have a term for this. It's called the availability heuristic. Uh, so it's uh, sort of a shortcut or heuristic that we use to judge how common something is based on how often we hear about it. Uh, so we tend to believe that false allegations of rape are common, even though they're not actually common at all, because either when a false allegation occurs or when a lot of people falsely uh, claim that a woman is lying, uh, that's all over the news. We hear about it a lot, and so we tend to believe that false allegations are common. Even though they're not common at all. But one thing that undeniably is common is for women who've been raped to not report it. And that happened so often that uh, in 2018, during the Senate hearings where Christine Blasey Ford accused uh, Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh of attempted rape, uh, a very uh, common uh, hashtag on Twitter and elsewhere was uh, why I didn't report. And there, were, there were hundreds of thousands of tweets on Twitter um, with that hashtag. Uh, a common reason given by many people who didn't believe Ford uh, for why they didn't believe her was uh, why did she wait 27 years to come forward? Uh, and in fact, uh, that's a very common rape myth. Uh, well, if it were true, you would have spoken up sooner. You know, why did you wait till now? Why did you wait till you know, Brett Kavanaugh was nominated for Supreme Court? Or why did you wait until um, you know, Donald Trump or Joe Biden or whoever was running for um, president? Uh, and why did you wait so long, if it's true? That's uh, also commonly uh, said about uh, rape allegations that aren't against uh, uh, well-known prominent people.
So uh, you know, when Brett Kavanaugh was up for a Supreme Court nomination, and uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, uh, he uh, got uh, the nomination, is not now on our Supreme Court, um, President Trump questioned her credibility, saying that if the attack was as bad as she says, she or her parents would have reported it to the authorities when it happened uh, more than 30 years ago uh, when she was in high school. Um, but there are many reasons why uh, women don't report um, allegations of sexual assault uh, or, or don't allege sexual assault uh, immediately after it happens. Uh, one reason is that it may take a, survival, a, a survivor a while to process the trauma and even to identify what has happened, according to Carolyn West, a psychology professor who specializes in studying sexual abuse and trauma. Uh, and even after that processing happens, uh, it's just a difficult thing to talk about. It, it's re-traumatizing to talk about it. So a lot of women uh, uh, don't even tell their uh, family members or friends or you know, have a hard time doing so. Uh, so one of the women interviewed for this uh, article here in the New York Times, uh, Caitlin uh, Long, said she felt that people would not believe her because she was in a relationship with the um, person, with the man who assaulted her. Um, and, of course, it is very common for women to be assaulted uh, by someone uh, they're in a relationship with uh, that happened uh, to a friend of mine. Um, another woman that they interviewed, Lerada uh, Chandomo, uh, felt a lot of shame because she'd been drinking a lot uh, when it happened, and, uh, you know, that's a common reason that uh, women are blamed or blame themselves is, uh, uh, well, you were drunk, uh, you know, you shouldn't have done that. Uh, another woman that was interviewed, Amy Selwyn, uh, who you know, kept silent about her um, uh, being assaulted for uh, decades, uh, said she was worried about her career. Um in fact, uh, Ms. Long uh, said that it took many months to realize that what she had experienced was sexual abuse, and months after that to tell her friends. Uh, she said it can be traumatic to say something and not feel heard and not feel believed. Uh, and she said that one of the reasons that she didn't file a complaint was uh, you know, just the stress that uh, reporting uh, abuse uh, produces. It's very draining. Um, and so she said, what I would say to people who are criticizing, criticizing survivors' decisions to come forward 30, 40, or 50 years later is that it may have taken them that long to process their trauma. It may have taken them that long to get to the point where they feel secure enough in what they've accomplished. Uh, so um, the uh, older woman of these three, um, Ms. Selwyn, um, said that uh, what happened in her case was a professional mentor took her to dinner, invited her to his room, and raped her. Uh, and she said, I felt stupid, I felt vulnerable, I felt humiliated, and I also felt like if I said anything, my career would be over. Uh, and, you know, much as women uh, who hold back on uh, alleging sexual assault uh, fear, uh, in fact, it is often very traumatizing uh, to uh, come forward with their uh, stories and sort of have to mentally relive uh, what happened. Uh, so Ms. Uh, Chandomo, uh, Chandomo said that uh, uh, when she uh, tweeted about her experience using the why I didn't report hashtag, uh, she, she was just really overwhelmed that, uh, with the number of responses that uh, she got. Even though uh, a lot of people expressed uh, support, uh, and she just felt kind of exposed and embarrassed and uh, anxious. Because uh, you know, even though it was 17 years after the event um, occurred when she finally uh, went public with it, uh, you know, this is still a, a very raw experience for her. Uh, uh, a lot of shame associated with it. Um, 
I felt so ashamed about the way I lived my life at that time and the fact that I was always judged based on how I looked or how I dressed, she said. Uh, and, and, and it's really very common for survivors to blame themselves. Um, Amy Smith, a nurse practitioner who treats uh, people who've been sexually assaulted, said, it's really the only crime where people doubt the victim immediately. If your car is stolen, uh, people don't ask you, are you sure it was stolen? Why were you driving such an expensive car? Um, you know, certainly very attractive uh, to thieves. Why were you doing that? Um, and she is... Um, someone who's treated a lot of survivors who didn't want to report assaults, um, such as women without the resources to leave relationships or teenagers who felt guilty because they had been drinking. drinking. Uh, and you know, one thing that's uh, very common uh, when uh, people are sexually assaulted, when they're raped, uh, and you know, this is something that... Uh, and women I know uh, have told me about is that they feel very sort of uh, detached, kind of as if it's an out of body experience or not real uh, when it's happening. And uh, uh, when we're under extreme trauma like that, often the mind focuses on uh, seemingly random details uh, while blocking out others. Uh, so, for example, uh, Tara Reid uh, reported. Uh, that she very vividly remembers the uh, feeling that the wall that she says she was pushed up against was uh, cold. Um, and uh, a woman I know uh, who was raped said she remembers uh, the uh, fan uh, in the um, uh, van where she was raped. Uh, remembers that very vividly, but has, uh, blocked out a lot of the rest. Uh, Ms. Smith said, went on to say that uh, psychologically when frightened or upset, a lot of my patients go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. The freeze mode is a dissociative type of situation because our brain is so protective of us. Um, and Ms. Selwyn wrote that she still remembers uh, the pattern of her assailant's salt, uh, socks as well as the pattern of the bedspread, but she doesn't remember what month it was. Uh, when she was assaulted, and uh, that's extremely common for women to uh, not remember the exact time or place uh, where the uh, assault occurred. But uh, just as uh, you know, false allegations of rape or uh, sexual assault are uh, you know, less common by quite a bit than we tend to believe because when they do occur, or when uh, a lot of people believe they've occurred. We hear about it a lot. Uh, the flip side is also the case. Uh, because we don't hear about uh, sexual harassment or assault in a lot of the cases where it happens, um, you know, we tend to underestimate how common it is. And that's especially true uh, for women who are not in a sort of privileged or powerful position, it's extremely hard uh, for them to come forward uh, because uh, you know, it's uh, more likely that they're going to be uh, disbelieved. So there are a lot of reasons why women don't report rapes to the police or delay doing so or don't tell anyone for a long time. They have trouble acknowledging what happened. They blame themselves sometimes. Uh, they're traumatized by retelling their story. Uh, they fear not believed, being believed or taken seriously. And they feel like they're going to be personally attacked and essentially put on trial instead of the person they're accusing. Um, and you know, the things that they fear usually uh, happen. Uh, in fact, um, so this is a graphic I found of uh, some of the common things that women are told. And of course, I don't believe you. Um, you know, did you scream? Did you try to prevent it? Uh, what were you wearing? Were you drunk? Uh, you have no proof. Um, uh, you know, why did you wait so long? Um, did you say no? You never said no. Um, and, you know, 
another thing, uh, it's not on this graphic, but uh, I, I see it a lot, um, is you know, you're kind of unique among um, criminal uh, conduct. Um, it, it's only in a case of rape um, or sexual assault where people say uh, that the testimony of the woman who says she was raped is not really evidence. Um, and you know, that's a very peculiar claim to make uh, because, in fact, uh, you know, the testimony of eyewitnesses is evidence in court cases. In fact, uh, social psychological studies suggest that um, eyewitness testimony is the most important piece of evidence in deciding the outcome of uh, criminal cases, uh, you know, for better or worse, uh, and you know, it may be uh, for worse in cases where uh, the eyewitness testimony involves uh, identifying the perpetrator in cases where they don't know the perpetrator, uh, which can be a you know, kind of shaky proposition given uh, the fallibility of our memory. But uh, you know, in many cases, eyewitness testimony is very uh, credible, and uh, you know, it, it, it's a very powerful uh, piece of evidence. Uh, but often uh, it's alleged that in the case of women who say they've been raped, uh, well, what's your evidence for that? You have no evidence, uh, which is BS. So the, the fear of being disbelieved and personally attacked uh, is a, a very common reason why women uh, don't come forward. Uh, and it's with a lot of justification. They are disbelieved. They are personally attacked in a lot of cases. Uh, but that's greatly magnified when the uh, person who's accused is a powerful and well-known person. So whether it's a well-known celebrity like Bill Cosby or Harvey Weinstein or a powerful politician or political figure like Donald Trump or Bill Clinton or Joe Biden or uh, Brett Kavanaugh, accusing uh, such a prominent person of sexual misconduct uh, inevitably results in enormous backlash. Uh, the man in question is um, going to have many loyal defenders, whether it be people in the uh, same industry or fans or supporters of the same political party. Um, and so uh, there's very often a lot of disbelief uh, of allegations against powerful men. Cognitive dissonance is a very important social psychological phenomenon that's uh, at play in this tendency that people have to side with the accused and disbelieve the accuser in uh, cases where it's somebody that uh, they uh, have some sort of uh, personal affinity for, whether it be uh, a friend or some prominent uh, political or entertainment figure that uh, people like and admire. Um, <clears throat> When people have some sort of pre-existing commitment to siding with the accused person, uh, for instance, if they intend to vote for a politician or they support the uh, politician's party, uh, there's a strong tendency to minimize or simply deny wrongdoing by that person uh, and disbelieve or attack uh, the accuser. And this tendency can be so strong that it can override um, a professed moral commitment to taking women's allegations of sexual misconduct seriously. Uh, and we'll get into that a lot more uh, in the next episode. But for now, uh, the important point to bear in mind is that there are strong disincentives to making uh, false allegations that are magnified in cases where the accused is someone uh, famous and uh, powerful. So the fact that women who are um, who make sexual misconduct allegations are just generally routinely uh, disbelieved and smeared, uh, you know, that's even more the case uh, in cases where the man is a powerful figure, such as Bill Clinton or Donald Trump or Harvey Weinstein. Of course, that doesn't mean it's impossible 
for false allegations of sexual assault or harassment to be made under such circumstances. It just means that uh, the sort of uh, facile dismissal of such allegations that one often sees uh, uh, from uh, partisans or fans of that person uh, you know, fails to take that context into account. So in other words, uh, uh, we seem to lose awareness of the fact that uh, it's very difficult, especially difficult in that circumstance, uh, uh, for women to come forward with these allegations. So there, you know, there's a very strong disincentive uh, to make false allegations, and very seldom is there, uh, are there reasons uh, for doing so, you know, benefit or gains from doing so that outweigh um, the likelihood that you're going to get an extremely powerful backlash. Okay, uh, well, with that background, so I, I'm going to uh, close this episode out uh, for today, and next time we will talk about the specific allegations uh, against presumptive uh, Democratic nominee uh, Joe Biden uh, and uh, why people do or do not uh, believe them. So uh, I will see you next time.